to Africa to escape the rage of a deadly king. There along the banks of the Nile, Jesus listened to the song that the captive children used to sing. And so we want you guys to help us write the songs. Does that sound fun? Sure. 
We need a name for our song. Do you have any ideas on what we could call it? Maybe I love moms or something. I, I like the I like the or something or at something. The end. I love song. That means I love you. <laughs> superhero moms. Superhero yeah. moms. Yes. If your mom was a superhero, what would her superpower be? Super fast at cleaning. If your mom was a superhero? <laughs> no, I, I can picture her in my head. It doesn't look good. <laughs> no, I can do it. Does your mom do anything this funny? If she sees a cookie, she really kind of eat it. She sees a cookie. She really wants to eat it, but she knows she probably shouldn't. But she still eat it. So she still eats it. <laughs> What's your favorite thing that your mom makes? Mm, biscotti. Are there any words that rhyme with biscotti? Um, Eddie. 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 Do you know somebody named Eddie? Mm -mm. What's something that we could sing that's about how good your mom's food is? She cooks a lot of meatloaf. She yeah. cooks a lot of meatloaf. You, what rhymes with meatloaf? Leetloaf. Leetloaf. <laughs> Leetloaf. Where does she like to go on little trips? Florida and Bixby. Florida and Bixby, those are two really nice places. Where could, where could we get some money to give our moms an awesome present? Underground buried? Underground buried? So we need to find some money that's buried. So we gotta dig for it. How, so, how much money do you think we can find if we dig for it? Um, seven. Seven dollars. Seven? Because it's kind of hard to find money underground. Yeah, it That's is. True. All right, what, what do you think would happen if all the moms in the world were gone? Well, it would be really dusty. Really, really dusty. Well, the kids and the dads would have to do all the work. What do you think would happen if all the moms in the world were gone? Uh, I wouldn't get any more cookies. I wouldn't get any breakfast. My dad likes the pasta a lot, so I would only get pasta. Baby. I would Perfect. maybe scream in the world until a mom pops up. Only thing we would be watching would be, uh, probably be football because a lot of boys like football. Do you have any, any words that we could start the song with? My mom is great. I love her shoes. I'm going to buy her outfit and a unicorn. You are the best mom in the whole wide world. Because they like me and my son. I love her smile and I love her love. And I love that she cares about me. Ha ha! <laughs> I think that we just wrote the best song in the wait, whole wait, world. Wait. This one goes out to you, moms. Imagine a world without moms Where we have to drive ourselves around All I see is football All I eat is pasta No meatloaf, holy loaf to be found This is a love song that means I love you I love moms or something It's not the same when you're not around Oh, I love moms or something If there were no more moms in
Happy Mother's Day. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hope that you're doing well. Happy Mother's Day to our beautiful mom, my beautiful Mushi Mushi and Mrs. Connie Brown. Happy Mother's Day. We love you guys so much. Yes, happy Mother's Day to my awesome mom, Connie. I love you. Thank you for being such a wonderful example to me um, as to what a Christian mom and woman and wife should be. And I love you so much. And I also honor my mother-in-law as well. So we're going to pray and we're going to worship Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to gather together in our homes and to worship you. And so we just offer our lives to you. Lord, please help us to have clean hands and pure hearts before you as we worship you today. And may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, that you can move mountains and that you can do so many wonderful things. And we just trust you, Father. We trust you with our future. We trust you with our lives. We trust you, Lord, with our country, God. And so, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would move. And we thank you that you are our deliverer, that you are our savior, you are our king. And we just declare you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords over our country and over our homes and over our individual lives, Lord. I'm sorry. 
Would you join me as we pray? Father, I thank you that we get to serve you, that we get to serve someone who is really the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, uh, not someone who uh, isn't in control, but someone who is completely in control. Father, that we get to come to you week in and week out, day after day, uh, knowing that you know what's to come, that you actually have a plan, and in the midst of uncertainty, that you're in charge. And so when we have needs in our lives, when we have uncertainty in our lives, we can lean on you and trust that you are going to make a way for us. So God, uh, as we come to you this morning or this afternoon or whatever time we are uh, watching this video, um, God, I pray that we would come to you knowing that you are in a position to fill our needs. So Lord, I, I pray for the needs that we have as a church right now, God, whether it's uh, it's financial needs, whether it's relational needs, uh, whether it's it's just a, a sense of loneliness and we need a father to come and, and put his arms around us and, and let us know that we are loved. Whatever our needs are this morning, God, will we come earnestly to the, to the foot of your cross and lay them down to you, knowing that you are a God who is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and who is really there to uh, provide for his children's in times of needs, God. So Lord, we come to you this morning. God, I continue to pray for our frontline workers, Lord. We say this week in and week out, but God, would you continue to uh, not only protect those who are at the front lines, Lord, those, the, the, the doctors and the nurses and those in the medical field that are serving our communities day in and day out, but also our political leaders, Lord, that you would give them a divine wisdom, a, a wisdom that could only come from our Father in heaven, Lord. And maybe they're not believers, maybe they're not people that follow uh, your son Jesus, but God, would you continue to pour out wisdom into their lives, God, so that they can make decisions that are going to better our communities, that are going to better our city, that are going to better our country and our world, Lord. God, would you continue to give them that wisdom. God, I want to take this opportunity to uh, just pray for our offering. Lord, it is such a privilege week in and week out that we get to worship and worship you with our finances, Lord. So God, I pray for the for us as we're about to uh, to practice that sign of worship, Lord, that God, you would take our money and you would multiply it and you would use it to bring glory to your kingdom, God. Lord, I pray for Pastor Rob as he uh, brings the word in a little bit, God, that Lord, you would anoint him, that you would bless each word that comes out of his mouth, and God, that you would prepare each of our hearts to be ready to receive. God, would you receive the glory and the honor in the rest of our service, Lord, and in your name, amen. All right, who's excited? I'm really excited. I don't know about you, but Pastor Rob kind of left us on a bit of a cliffhanger last week. I was kind of upset. I don't know about you, but I was leaving thinking, come on, like I want more. I can't end on that. I have to wait a whole nother week to hear more about the book of Revelations. Well, the wait is over. We are about to go into a time where we're going to dive into God's word. But quickly, I want to just share a couple of announcements. Again, we've been saying it each and every single week. And if you're tired of hearing me say it, well, I'm sorry. I, I apologize, but I'm going to say it again. Facebook Live. If you have not checked it out yet, honestly, I don't know what your excuse is. I've been working each day. Pastor Rob's been working each day. We have other people that are working from home and we're still checking it out each and every single day. So if you're at home and don't know what to do at 930 in the morning, check us out at Facebook Live where Pastor Rob has been leading us through a morning devotional every single morning. It's been incredible. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's quick. It's short. It's sweet. It's good. It's full of the word. And it's just something to start your day off right uh, diving into God's word and just getting a little bit inspiration and encouragement to start your day. So 930 at Facebook Live, we are doing our morning devotional. So if you haven't checked it out yet, take this opportunity uh, Monday morning or Tuesday morning or whatever day uh, you're waking up. Maybe it's Thursday. I don't know. Every single day, Monday to Friday, we have it. And so if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Um, and secondly, on Facebook Live, we have our Bible study. This is happening at Wednesday nights at seven o'clock. If you haven't checked it out yet, it's not too late. They're still running at seven o'clock on Wednesday. So you gotta go to Facebook Live and check that out where Pastor Rob has been leading us through uh, the scriptures and just really unpacking things and teaching us. And it's been incredible. So check us out at Facebook Live. Again, I wanna mention that it is our responsibility as a body of believers to really be reaching out to each other in this time. 
uh, to really be checking in with each other, praying for each other, just uh, if it's a phone call, a text, an email, whatever it may be, really take this as an opportunity to reach out to those around you in your community, um, people on Facebook, if you have their contacts on their phone, whatever it is. Really be praying for each other, really be checking in on each other. This is a great opportunity for us to really build and to connect as a community and it can go beyond our Thursday and Sunday experiences and really just be an awesome time for us to reach out to each other. Um, I, again, have been hearing stories of uh, some of you guys taking this upon yourself, taking the initiative to do this, and the results have been incredible. Just hearing how people have been stepping into people's lives and filling needs that if you hadn't have reached out, you wouldn't have known about. And so just good on you for those who have been doing that. And if you haven't, I encourage you, begin to reach out to uh, some of your friends, some of your congregant members, uh, fellow believers in Christ, and those in your community, you will, won't be disappointed by the results you'll see when you begin to reach out to those around you and to be praying for each other. Uh, that is it for me. If you are not uh, prepared, take a quick moment, take another sip of coffee, get out your notepads, your Bibles, uh, check that there is ink in your pen because you're going to want to take down some notes today as we welcome Pastor Rob to bring the word. Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to Church Online. We're glad you are joining us today. We're excited. We are concluding our series, The End is Near. Today, looking at our final section in the book of Revelation, snapshots from Revelation. If you missed it, let's give a little recap from last week. We are kind of looking at how we can see Jesus in every section of Revelation, and we've broken it in two five sections. And last week we learned that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He's the returning king. We looked at that in chapters one and two. And then chapters uh, three and four, we understood that Jesus is the Lamb of God, that he is the one that is worthy to open the scroll. And then we did a little pause button on that. And we talked about some of those issues where questions were coming forward. We, we looked at uh, the Antichrist. We looked at the mark of the beast. We looked at Armageddon. And my heart is that you've gotten a little bit of an understanding, a baseline foundation foundation that you can build on. Again, understanding that Revelation is not a book that we need to be afraid of, but it's actually a book that should inspire faith in us because we know the end of the story. Really, this is a revelation of who Jesus is revealing it to us. And John is getting a revelation and revealing it to his readers and Today we will continue that journey looking at the final couple of sections in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's interesting. It's going to get a little chaotic. It's going to get a little freaky, but I want you to stay with me. Lean in. I want you to stay with me again. This is not to inspire fear, but it's just the reality now. The section that we're going to get into, it's going to be the judgment of the world. And that is what we see next in Revelations chapter 6 to verse 18. What we see is Jesus as the righteous judge. He is a righteous judge. And when you begin to read these, and I hope you're reading it, again, we're encouraging you to dive into the Bible for yourself. We're not putting this, the scriptures up on the screen. We want you to dig in. And I'm hoping that throughout the week that you're maybe diving into the book of Revelation and reading it. And if you got questions, you're sending them in. But when you read chapters 6 through 18, read it remembering that Jesus is a righteous judge. And the main theme of these chapters is Jesus judges the earth righteously. Now is judgment time. Now is the world is going to be judged. And we see three sets of seven judgments. We'll, we'll look at the seven seals in Revelation 6. We'll look at the seven trumpet judgments in, in Revelations 8 to 9, and then the seven bowl judgment in Revelation 16. So let's dive into these a little bit. Again, we're, we're not going to dive really deep into them. We're going to go a little below the surface and help give you an understanding of what these judgments are, how they're being done, when are they being done, and so we can dig into that. So here you go. I want you to get your Bibles out. I want you to go to Revelations chapter 6. Again, if you're in your Bible, it's the very last book of the Bible, Revelations chapter 6, and we're going to look at the seal judgments, the seal judgments, and there's seven of them. 
seven seal judgments. And the first of the four seal judgments, they deal, the first four of these seal judgments, they deal with the, the four riders of the apocalypse. And we'll look at those and, and we'll see the first seal is there's this white horse. Uh, and anytime that you see a white horse, maybe it's a movie, you see the hero is riding in on a white horse, not this story. This white horse is, is not the hero. This is the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist coming onto the scene. And we read in Revelation 6, verse 2, it says, He and he that sat on him had a bow and went forth conquering and to conquer. Now we see this rider on the white, white horse has a bow, but there's no mention of an arrow. And that is an indication that this, this rider may think he has power, but he doesn't have absolute power. And so we see this. Now you're asking about a timeline, these judgments, when does it take place? These first judgments that we see, the seal judgments, they are kind of the beginning of the tribulation. Probably in the first three and a half years, the very beginning, these are when these judgments are taking place. And so we have the first seal is the white horse and the second seal that is broken. It reveals a red horse, which represents war. The third seal is a black horse, which represents famine. Uh, the fourth seal is a, a pale horse, which represents death, where an actual quarter of the world population is going to die, is going to be taken out by this seal. And then the fifth seal is the seal of the martyrs and who had given their lives for Jesus during the tribulation. And the sixth seal is there's this great earthquake that takes place. Um, and again, looking at a timeline, you're looking at the first part of the tribulation. Now, the good thing is, like me, pre-trib, the rapture has happened, we are gone. And so begins these judgment seals. And um, but the, it, very interesting, when you read these first set of seals, they tie right in to Matthew 24. When Jesus talks about, when he's talking about to the disciples, when the disciples say, what are some of the things that we should be looking for? What does he say? Well, be careful that nobody deceives you, for many will come in my name. And what is the role of the Antichrist? To deceive, to pull people away from worshiping God to worshiping him. Then it says you'll hear of wars in rumors of wars. And what is that? It's the, it's the red horse and there'll be famines and, and there'll be earthquakes. And so you see everything that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 to his disciples, we see this unfolding in this first set of the seven judgments. And, and it's when you think about what is happening, it's it's crazy and thinking, is there going to be any hope, man, when you think a quarter of the world's population is going to be taken out by this, this fourth seal? Is there any hope for us? And yeah, there is. There's still hope for, for people who have not been raptured, for people who are still left behind. There's still hope because God is still saving, redeeming, and, and allowing people uh, to for, repent of their sins. And so... All of a sudden, the opening of the seventh seal comes the sounding of the seven next judgments that are going to take place. Now, when we're, when we're reading this, you got to think, are they continuous? Are they happening one after another? They're progressive and they're probably lasting a while. There's only one of the judgments that we see that has a specific timeline uh, attached to it. And we'll get into that as we dive into this next set of judgments. So we started with the seven seal judgments. Now we go into the seven trumpet judgments. And this is where angels come, followed one after another, and they blow the trumpet and chaos begins to follow. Chaos begins to follow these judgments. These are a little bit harsher. And again, when you're looking at timeline, this is now probably after three and a half years of the tribulation, getting into the latter part of the tribulation, because it gets a little bit more intense. And if this happened earlier on, you would think, man, there wouldn't be much left uh, for, the, for the final scene. So we look at these. These are found in Revelations chapter 8 and 9 and chapter 11. And that's where we'll be kind of looking here. And the first four of these judgments go against the world. And the last three of these judgments go against humans. So the first four, 
against the world, the last three against humans. So we see the first trumpet that comes and it says you will see fire and hail mixed with blood and it's going to fall from the sky. Think about that one. Going to fall from the sky and a third of the trees are going to be destroyed and burned up. All the green grass is going to be burned up. And so you think just like that, a third of the trees and all the green grass gone. Gone. You think, wow, that's kind of crazy. Then you have the second trumpet. You're going to see the oceans and the seas. A third of them are going to become polluted and it's going to, they're going to become like blood. A third of the sea creatures are going to die. A third of the ships are going to be destroyed. Wow, that's pretty harsh. Wait for it. The third trumpet, now it is, we've seen the salt water affected, now it's the fresh water polluted. A third of the rivers are destroyed and people begin to die from the bitter water that they are drinking. The fourth trumpet, you see the air is polluted and a third of the sun, the moon, and the stars are blacked out. Their light is blacked out and, and some have attested to and some scholars believe, could this be a nuclear war? We don't know. We're not speculating or saying anything like that, but they're saying there is uh, some nasty stuff that has taken place. So you see the, the land is being affected. You see the water, fresh and salt water being affected and the air is being affected um, then it gets really, really crazy because you think that's bad enough. When, when you think about that, that's bad enough. But here's the beautiful thing. When you read it, I, I've heard a lot of questions come forward. And even in my time studying, why a third? Why was a third affected? And there's nowhere in scripture to indicate that this is why only a third of the planet was affected during these Judgments, But what we can see with it only being a third, you see how sovereign God is to uh, do and how calculated he is to do what he wants to do. That it's not random, but it is very specific in the way that God is judging it. And it goes way back to the Exodus when God was going to rescue the children of Israel out of Egypt and how precise he was with each one of the plagues that were released on the Egyptians. Now, so we're looking at those first four trumpet judgments. Now comes the fifth judgment. And before this, you can read it for yourself in scripture. The angel says, whoa, 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 for these next coming judgments, because they're pretty intense. And this fifth one, this fifth judgment of the trumpets that we see is probably one of the most harsh judgments that we see on the world and that we'll probably ever see on the world. And what is this? Well, it's poisonous locusts. You think, yeah, we've heard about those crazy hornets that are making their way. I'm telling you, you don't want to be around when these things come onto the scene. Poisonous locusts. And actually they are demonic spirits. It says they are released from the bottomless pit. This is where the worst of the worst of the demons are kept. It says they're released from the bottomless pit and they are the body of locusts with the tails like a scorpion and they're huge and these things just come in droves and they're released and they are allowed for five months. This is the first judgment that we see that has a timeline permitted to it. They're for five months allowed to torment. They're not allowed to kill. They are allowed to torment Humans. They're not allowed to touch vegetation or anything like that. They are allowed to torment humans. And you read in Revelations 9, verse 5, it says, Men will seek death, but they're not going to be able to find it. They're going to wish as though they were dead. And here's the beautiful thing. The ones that God has preserved, that God has saved, the ones who have not taken the mark, they're okay. They're not going to be affected by this at all. So you think about that. All these judgments are taking place. And then you have this sixth judgment. And it says with this, one third of all mankind is destroyed. One third of all the humans are destroyed. So you see what is going on. Imagine being here for this. A third of the vegetation is destroyed. A third of the water is contaminated. A third of the sea creatures die. A third of the light is lost. A third of the world dies. This is a bad time. This is a, not a, a fun time to be alive. Jesus said, men, woe to you that are alive during this time because it's going to get hard. 
And so the seventh trumpet comes and it announces the final victory. It's the angel announcing the final victory. And here's the thing that I want you to remember. Maybe you're reading this and you're thinking, oh, this is crazy. I don't get this. I don't understand this. This is what I want you to get at the core of who you are. During all of this time, during all of this that is going on in the book of Revelation, God is still giving people a chance to respond to him. God is still giving people a chance to repent of their sins. There's still grace even in this moment for those who would call upon the name of the Lord. But here's the fascinating thing when you read it. When you dive into it, there's still many that choose to remain stubborn and in their sin. And you read it in, in verse 20, they did not repent. They did not repent of their deeds. And yet they would, they would shake their fist at God and blaspheme God. And I'm telling you, man, if I missed the rapture and if I'm around for this and I had somebody talk to me and I'm seeing all this, you better believe I am getting right with God. I'm saying, okay, God, it's true. This is, this is it. I am responding and I'm getting right. But it still says in this, people still harden their hearts. Think about this judgment that is taking place. They still Harden their hearts, but it's very important to understand that God in his love and his mercy is still giving people a chance to respond. And a lot of people think that, well, this is weird. Understand, Revelation is a book. It's written to reveal to us Jesus, but also to prepare us for what is to come. It's not like this should catch people off guard because it's in his word. It was written to reveal to us what is to come. Remember, blessed are those who read this book, who hear it, and do what it requires. So we see the seven trumpets, those seven judgments, where it's a third of the earth is affected by these. Now we get to the seven bowls, where it's the whole earth is affected. And these are the last of the judgments of God. And these ones are probably towards the very end of the tribulations, because <laughs> if these happened at the beginning, there's not much left of the world after these judgments. And we pick these ones up in Revelations chapter 16, verses 1 to 21. And so you see these different bowls that are now poured out, these judgments of God that are poured out over the earth. And the first bowl is its painful sores painful sores that are going to be released on all people, on all of those who have chosen to take the mark of the beast. Those that have resisted and still are around and said, no, I'm not going to worship the Antichrist. I'm not taking that mark. They're not affected by this one. They are not affected by this one. The second bowl that we see is the seas and the oceans. Remember the last, the trumpet judgments was just a third of them. This is all the oceans turned to blood, all the seas turned to blood, and every creature dies. That's harsh. Every creature dies. Then again, keeping in line, the third bowl is released and it's now all the fresh water. All the fresh water in the uh, is, is dealt with and the, the fresh water done turns to blood. The fourth bowl is now the sun is beginning to scorch people. It's burning people and still people don't repent. They still choose to do their own thing and to blaspheme God and to say, I'm not, forget it, I'm not turning, I'm not doing anything. So the fifth bowl, there's darkness and pain come over all the earth. Darkness and pain come over all the earth. And then the sixth bowl is the Euphrates. The mighty Euphrates River dries up to make ways for the armies of the kings that will come in setting the stage for the final battle, the battle of Armageddon. And the, and the seventh bowl, man, this one is crazy. Uh, there's a hailstorm. How many have ever been part of a hailstorm? You out there and you're getting pelted with these little things. 100 pound hailstones that will be falling from the sky. Think about that. A hundred pound hailstones and yet people will still curse God. It's interesting when you look at these final judgments on the earth and if you go back to the book of Exodus, you see very similar the same judgments that were on the Egyptians at the time. The, the water to blood, the, the darkness, the painful sores. You see all of that kind of happening here. Now here's what a lot of people are saying. And maybe even you're thinking to yourself, man, God is so unfair. 
How could he allow something like this to happen? How can he allow this to happen to the world that he created? That is not a fair God. That is a mean, nasty God. But last week we looked at in understanding, no, God is absolutely fair. He is absolutely just and right in his judgment. See, up until this point, People have had ample opportunity to turn from their sin, to repent, to get right with God. Because of what Jesus had done, God so loved the world that he sent his son to die to make a way for you and I, to make a way for people to get right with God so they don't have to go through this. Ample time and time and time again, God gives opportunity. But yet it's the hardness of the hearts of the people that have made the choice. And then we get mad at God because he's allowing this and it's almost like God knew this and in even John because what the angel says to John in Revelation 16 5 says this then I heard the angel in charge of the water say you are just in these judgments you need to underline that in your Bible you are just in these judgments you who are and who were the holy one because you have so judged when you think about what is going to go on with those three sets of judgments, it's pretty intense. It is pretty intense. But God is, he's warned us. He's prepared us. He's made a way for us to avoid all of that, that all we need to do is come to the understanding that, hey, I can't do this without Christ, that I need his forgiveness in my life. And if we're willing to do that, we're adopted into the family of God, that we don't have to be around for this but yet because so many people are deceived and they buy into the tricks and the schemes of the enemy and understanding that this time and age it even says even the very elect are going to be deceived the ones that think they they know it all the ones that think they have a good understanding even they're going to be deceived so there's never been an easier time to get right with God than now. There's never been an easier time to say, you know what, Jesus, yeah, I need you. And not out of a fear tactic. No, 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 no. But out of an understanding that it's only in Christ do you get to live your most amazing life. It's only in Jesus. And this is all just kind of a warning. This is stuff that we see signs beginning to unfold that should excite us. Why? Because we are longing for the return of Christ because then we get to live with him forever. So we see, who is Jesus in Revelation? He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Lamb of God. He is the righteous judge who judges the world righteously. And then in chapters 19 and 20, we see Jesus is the King of Kings. Oh, say that. He is the king of kings. And it's in this portion we see him returning with his church. And I'm going to read a couple verses. And so, again, you dig into your Bible. You can follow along with me. I'm going to read from the NIV version. But Revelations 19, verse 11 to 16 says this. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Now, this is a different white horse that we saw in the first seal judgment. This is now Jesus on his white horse. This truly is the hero, the victor, the, the savior returning. He says he's on his uh, white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. You know what? Go back to the book of John, who was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, that's us, riding on white horses dressed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And get this, on his robes and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can I tell you, 
Jesus is not some candidate that you and I elect in and out of office. No, he was and is and is to come since the beginning of time. He is the king of kings. And when you read Revelations, you will begin to see Jesus for who he truly is. And that should build your faith. Why? Because he's the Alpha and Omega. He's the Lamb of God. He's the righteous judge. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and brings us to to our final section of Revelation, what we begin to see that Jesus is the bridegroom. And we see that in Revelations 21 and 22. And it's when Jesus is coming to take us, his bride, to that final destination, the heavenly city, the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And we read that in Revelations 21 verses 9 and 10. And then in verse 23, and it says this, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming out, coming down out of heaven from God. Then in verse 23, I love this because. This is where we get to spend eternity for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is where we get to spend eternity. And this is amazing. The city does not need a sun or a moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light. And the lamb is its lamp. Man, that is incredible. So what is Jesus saying today? What would he be saying to you? What would he be saying to me? Well, I think it's the same thing that he said right from Genesis through to Revelation. What he's saying to people who don't know him, maybe those who are far from him, what is he truly saying? Well, let's see it in Revelations 22, verse 17. And if you're tuning in with us, and maybe you've never been to church online, maybe you've never been to church, period, and you got wind of this or somebody invited you through a text message saying, you need to come, you want to find out about the end of the world, we're talking about it, come and find out. And you've never experienced anything like this. And maybe you're saying, well, this is a little freaky. I don't understand this. I want you to get the simplest form what Jesus is saying to you today. So I want everybody to lean in. Everybody to lean in. You know Christ, I want you to lean in. You're far from God, I want you to lean in. You're exploring, you're, you, I want you to lean in because this is what I believe he's saying with all my heart. And I want you to hear with both ears and all your heart. Revelations chapter 22, uh, verses 20 and 21 say this. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. Then he says, uh, come Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with God's people. But before that, check out what he says. And this is so good. Before that, he says, the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears come. Let him who hears, let him come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And let him take the free gift, the water of life. What's Jesus saying? Come. He's saying, guys, I got something better for you. I got something greater for you. Man, you don't have to live bound to sin and guilt and shame anymore. That you can walk in freedom. Oh, just Come. The same thing that he's been saying since Genesis all the way to Revelation. He is shouting it loud today. Come. All who are weird, all who are heavy laden, just come to me and I will give you rest. Why? Because he is coming again. Jesus is coming again. If we can see anything in scripture, the plan was set way back in the book of Genesis, that relationship would be restored, that we could be restored in a right relationship with God. And when Jesus came onto the scene and died for our sins and then rose again and, and was whisked away to heaven, so began the end times. And what we are living today is the end times because Jesus will come back again. And we see that. He says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am am coming soon. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. Will you be ready? 
Will you be ready? Or are you just kind of kind of continue to do your own thing? I don't know where you're at and I don't know what your belief is and, and I don't know what your faith is. And I don't know, may, I know many are watching that are in that right relationship whose sins have been forgiven. Not, we're not perfect, but you know what? We're, we're moving forward in grace, that God's grace is there to help us become all that he wants us to be. But maybe you're here and today and, and you've not made that choice. Come. Would you hear him calling to you today, just come. So let's take a moment and let's pray. And then I want us to respond. So God, we thank you uh, for those today who truly want to live a life on earth that really matters for eternity. God, I pray that your spirit would do a work in all of us, even right now that you would convict some of us, that you would challenge some of us to deal with our sin. Lord, that we would turn and begin to confess that you are Lord, that we would give you that rightful place in our heart in life, that we would be changed and transformed. God, I pray for those that are watching today, maybe that need to reprioritize their life. God, the Lord, that they would make those choices and decisions to put you first uh, and do the right thing. God, I pray that all of us, that we would be burdened for those who don't know you. Uh, God, those that are far from you, that, Lord, that we understand that the time is close to your returning. God, that we would be a good witness, that we would testify of your love and your mercy, letting other people know of what is to come and that there's hope for them, that there's life for them. Father, I pray that we would truly live a life that reflects you in all that we do. In every, in, wherever we go and whatever we do, that would reflect you, your goodness, your mercy, and your love, that we would truly begin to make a difference in this world. Now, let me say this. I believe there's some of you right now that maybe there's something happening on the inside. And again, maybe you thought you were just kind of tuning in to check this out. Uh, and, and you feel something on the inside that you can't quite explain. And uh, if I can be honest, I believe with all my heart that's God working on the inside of you, drawing you to him. That's God's spirit working, drawing you to him. And, and maybe you've never checked out church and no desire to check out church. But now there's this stirring. That's God. And you have a choice. Are you going to embrace that? Are you going to heed what he's saying? Are you going to say, hey, Come. Man, I got a plan for your life. It's incredible. All the things that you've been searching and looking and longing for in this world that have left you empty and void. I am the fulfillment of everything you long for. Come, just come, just come. And he's stirring on the inside. And what he's longing is for you to be in a relationship with him. He desires a relationship with you. And it's as easy as us acknowledging we can't do it on our own. Jesus, I need you. Would you forgive me of my sin? Yeah, all of us have sinned. Every single one of us falls short. Doesn't matter how good you think you are. Doesn't matter how many good deeds you do, that we are all sinners. And until our sin is forgiven. And how is it forgiven? By us acknowledging what Jesus did on the cross and by accepting that free gift of salvation and saying, Jesus, I need you in my life. I surrender to you because I can't do this on my own. Come to me, all who are weary and thirsty. Come to me and you're going to experience life. You're going to experience life to the fullest. Because when we understand who Jesus is, he's the Alpha and he's the Omega. He is the Lamb of God. He's the righteous judge. He is the King of Kings. He is the bridegroom and he is coming again for his Bride. So if that's you and you've never said yes to Jesus, what we're going to do is we're going to pray. And in the box, and if you're watching on church online, you're going to see uh, a box pop up and it's going to say, hey, listen, that's me. I'm, I'm committing my life to Jesus. I want you to click that button. And then another box is going to come up. And it's going to say, connect with us. We want to know and we want to help you on that journey that you are not alone, that you don't have to walk through this alone, that we are there with you every single step of the way to help you become all that Jesus wants you to be. 
So would you join me? Would you join me as we pray? And uh, today it's exciting that we can do this, that there's mercy and grace that we can respond to Jesus. Tell you what, let's every single one of us, if you're church online, if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, you just go ahead and pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of all my sins. I believe Jesus is the Lamb of God who gave his life so I could live. Jesus, today, would you be my Savior? Would you be my Lord? Take my whole life. It now belongs to you. And I thank you for the new life I have in you. Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me so I can serve you all the days of my life. In your wonderful name I pray. And everybody said... Amen. Well, guys, thanks for tuning in to Church Online. The chat room will stay open for a little bit. Again, if you need prayer, click the prayer button. We'd love to be able to pray with you. We encourage you to stay connected throughout the week, checking out our Facebook Live devotions uh, every single morning, Monday to Friday at 9.30, then on Saturdays at 9. Uh, and remember, you're not alone. God bless you guys, and we'll see you again soon.